Hi, my name is Richard Isaacson. I'm director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York Presbyterian. Today, we're gonna to be talking about endpoints in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials. Let's talk about the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale cognitive subscale, also known as the ADAS-COG. This is one of the most commonly used assessment measures that assesses performance outcomes and is honestly probably the most frequently used cognitive outcome in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, especially the trials that were done in the past 10 to 20 years. There are a variety of subtests on the score that are very relevant to declines in Alzheimer's specific brain regions. So for example, word recall, the ability to follow commands, word finding ability, spoken language, delayed recall, naming objects, word recognition. These are all elements or cognitive domains or cognitive assessment tests that are very relevant to track in the progression of Alzheimer's disease. The maximum score on this test is 70 points and the higher the score indicates a more severe impairment. When we think about proposing a meaningful change threshold, especially in the early Alzheimer's disease phase, a three point uh, decline is more along the lines of clinically meaningful. When it comes to using the ADAS-COG in terms of clinical practice, it's tricky because there are several limitations, although there are also several benefits. Let's talk about the limitations. The limitations include that they take a long time to administer this test. It's a very long assessment. The duration of the assessment is not really practical or feasible for most uh, people in clinical practice. There's also a limited ability to detect specific treatment effects as a single endpoint. Um, in clinical practice, we're thinking about lots of different things from terms of cognition and function and quality of life. And this is uh, kind of uh, focused in terms of very specific cognitive domains. Um, also, um, if a person has high IQ, has a high level of education, that may also impact assessment and um, you know the, the, the scoring and the trajectory of change may differ in someone who is very well educated uh, versus someone who has a lower uh, educational attainment. Uh, the score may also not be completely meaningful in terms of a mismatch from decline in daily function versus how someone is doing in everyday life. So for example, just because someone is having uh, maybe more trouble with their short-term memory, they still may be able to take care of themselves and they still may be able to um, you know, get by in everyday life and, and, and handle their activities of daily living. But you may have a change on the ADAS-COG, but you may have no change in terms of real world uh, everyday life. Also, the scale is uh, more suited for maybe the more mild to moderate stages of disease. In the more severe stages, uh, you know, it's uh, people can't really cooperate with parts of the test and the scores uh, may be more difficult to interpret. These scores also may not be as helpful in the very early mild cognitive impairment and even, um, you know, especially the, the preclinical pre-symptomatic phases of Alzheimer's because the ceiling of change uh, will not be uh, as robust. There are also several uh, different versions of the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale cognitive subset, the 11, 12, 13, and 14, that basically includes different, um, a different uh, basically tests that can help uh, fine tune or refine the ability to interpret it. Uh, but in terms of the benefit, uh, the benefit is in a lot of ways, it, it has been the gold standard in clinical trials. So if it is decided to be used, at least you can get a sense of how uh, a person is doing in practice compared to how a person is, has done in a directly comparable way in a clinical trial.